is the uh, fourth Wednesday. <laughs> Sorry, the microphone was down under there. <laughs> it's the fourth uh, West Vespers of Lent, and we are walking our way through Psalm 41 tonight in verse 6 especially focusing on empty words, many different ways in which words are empty, but of course we have Christ who is the word of life and brings us life. Uh, the order of service will be Vespers 229, the opening hymn 427, we remain seated for the opening hymn and rise from the verse of yes.
41. Blessed is the one who considers the poor. In the day of trouble, the Lord delivers him. Sustains him on his sick bed. In his illness, you restore him to full health. As for me, I will stand before the gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies say of me in malice, When will he die and his name perish?
first reading is Psalm 52. Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all the day. Your tongue plots destruction. Like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good, and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous shall see and fear, and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches, and sought refuge in his own destruction. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever, because you have done it. I will wait for your name, for it is good in the presence of the godly. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from James chapter 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The third reading from the Passion reading drawn from the Four Gospels, Part 4, the Praetorium. When they had bound Jesus, they led him from Caiaphas to the Hall of Judgment and gave him over to Pontius Pilate the governor. It was early. They themselves did not go into the judgment hall so that they might not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? He answered and said to him, If you were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Then Pilate said to them, Take him then and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. So the word of Jesus was fulfilled, signifying by what death he should die. The charges they brought against him were, We found this fellow perverting the nation, and forbidding us to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ the King. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the King of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Do you say this for yourself, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Do you take me for a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have given you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of the, this world, then my servants would have thought that I should not be given over to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. I was born and I came into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in this man. The chief priest kept laying one charge after another against him, but he answered not a word. Pilate questioned him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many charges they lay against you. Jesus answered him not a word. Pilate was utterly amazed. He said to the chief priest and the crowd, I find no case against this man. They pressed their charges more vehemently. 
He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. When he learned that he belonged in Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him on to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem for those days. When Herod saw Jesus, he was delighted, for he had long wished to see him because of what he had heard of him, and he hoped to see him do a miracle. He questioned Jesus repeatedly, but he gave him no answer. The chief priests and scribes stood there and vehemently accused him. Herod and his soldiers mocked him. They put a splendid robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that same day, for before this they had been at enmity with each other. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You have brought this man before me as one subverting the people. See now, I have examined him before you, and have found nothing in this man guilty of any of your charges against him, and neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Mark this, he has done nothing worthy of death. I will have him punished and release him. Now it was, now at the feast, it was the governor's custom to release to the crowd any one prisoner whom they asked for. They had then a notorious prisoner named Barabbas. He was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection in the city. Pilate knew that it was out of malice that the chief priest handed Jesus over. Therefore he said to them, Do you want me to release to you Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Pilate asked them again, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they cried out all together, saying, Away with this man and release for us Barabbas. While Pilate was sitting in the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message. Do not have anything to do with that man. I have suffered much over him today in a dream. Again, Pilate addressed him, for he wished to release Jesus. He said to them, What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? What shall I do with him, whom you call the King of the Jews? They all cried out, Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no guilt worthy of death in him. I will therefore punish him and let him go. They cried out all the louder, Crucify him! Crucify him! Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers of the governor led him away into the praetorium. They gathered the whole band of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a purple robe on him. When they had woven a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. They knelt down and did him homage. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I bring him out to you that you may know. I find him not guilty. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. When the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I do not find him guilty. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you, and I have power to release you? Jesus answered, You would not have any power over me at all, unless it had been given to you from above. For that reason, he who handed me over to you has the greater sin. This prompted Pilate to go on, trying to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the preparation of Passover, about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold, your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but rather a riot was underway, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent to the blood of this man. See to it yourselves. Then all the people responded, His blood be on us and on our children. And Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, gave sentence that it should be as they demanded. 
He released to them Barabbas, for whom they asked, the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. He had Jesus flogged, and then gave him over to their will to be crucified. The soldiers mocked him, stripped him of the purple robe, put his own clothes on him, and let him out to crucify him. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Response Deliver me, O Lord my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Lies, so though they can be, 
Empty words could simply be evasive, kind of dancing around the truth, communicating little or nothing, no concrete truth, no commitment, no endurance. Sometimes we get comfortably accustomed to empty words. Even speaking empty words, we never stop hearing them. They go on and on. And one threat of empty words is that their constant flow might cause us to stop listening altogether. Seems like our everyday conversation often is uses empty words. How are you? I'm fine. Have a good day. You know, we hope that we would sincerely mean those things when we say them, but it seems like we even lose track of our conversations from just a few seconds beforehand. Maybe that lack of memory indicates a certain emptiness to the words that we hear or speak. Solomon says in, in Ecclesiastes, let your words be few, few. James encourages us to be slow to speak, and even in our second reading compares the things we say are tongues to forest fires. Advertising is full of empty words. I mean, they're all over the place at stadiums or on the radio or web pages filled with advertisements, images, and empty words. And we get used to the puffery, the invasiveness, the false urgency of those words that we often don't em notice how empty they truly are. Politicians speak a lot of empty words as they make pledges to cause us to, or to get us to vote for them, but it seems like even supporters don't expect them to keep their words. Personal promises come to mean very little. Even long-term commitments are uh, often subject to emotion rather than endurance. King David lived in a time when words ought to have meant something a bit more, and yet he decried the empty words spoken by those who were his enemies, words issued to create and initiate hostility and animosity. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, it's quite in contrast to Jesus Christ himself, who is the embodiment of God's living word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus speaks the words that have eternal life. When we were joined to him in baptism, we were connected and cleansed of our sins and joined to a community for whom words matter. In the church, we hear and speak words that are true. We confess the creed. We hear and listen to the word of God in the scriptures. And David's words also belong in the mouth of Jesus Christ. When one comes to see me, he utters empty words while his heart gathers iniquity. When he goes out, he tells it abroad. Like us, Jesus of Nazareth had plenty of empty words around him, empty, deceptive words, accusations against him that were lies, empty words that also proved to be deadly for him. Ultimately, the deadliest words come from the devil. His empty words started in the Garden of Eden. You will not surely die, he said, contradicting the word of God who told Adam and Eve not to eat that fruit. But it was a lie. God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God. How false that was. Later, the devil's empty words tempted Jesus. If you are the Son of God, throw yourselves down. Throw yourself down. All these kingdoms of the world I will give you. But they were empty words. Peter, the disciple, earnestly desired to follow Jesus and had the best intentions, and yet he also uttered empty words. He, at the... Uh, at the uh, Mount of Transfiguration. Lord, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Expecting to praise Jesus by equating him with those prophets, but not understanding who Jesus truly was or what he was saying. 
And of course, Peter's expression, even if I, I must die with you, I will not deny you. And then he turned around that very day and denied he even knew Jesus. I do not know the man. What empty words those were. And the disciples also, the other disciples, joined their empty words, making pledges that were empty, that they would never deny Christ, or even maybe the emptiest of all, the deadliest of all, uh, Judas Iscariot. Is it I, Rabbi? And greeted him even with a kiss. When one comes to see me, he utters empty words while his heart gathers iniquity. When he goes out, he tells it abroad. The empty words spoken about Jesus even caused Jesus to be sentenced to death, as we heard, on the testimony of those who spoke, and spoke falsely. At the trial last week, we heard how the chief priests and whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death, but found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Empty words. When one comes to see me, he utters empty words while his heart gathers iniquity. When he goes out, he tells it abroad. Isn't that how it seems like that's the, the deepest, um, the deepest, the uh, way in which our enemies mistreat us. They come and pretend to be friends, pretend to be compassionate, listening, caring, and yet they take what they see and hear and, and turn it around, betraying us. Or people make commitments to us and don't keep them. Or we enter some business contract and someone we think is trustworthy violates that trust. They did not consider their words as a, as a true commitment. And those things hurt. David's words and our Lord's words can also be our words. And really, when we face that kind of betrayal, uh, praying these words of David are healing to us. When one comes to see me, he utters empty words while his heart gathers iniquity. When he goes out, he tells it abroad. Praying those words reminds us that we are not alone in facing that situation that we so often face. In fact, David, the whole church, and Jesus Christ, our Savior himself, is pr are praying those words with us. Jesus knew the heartbreak of betrayal. He knew the, the dismay that rises from a sense of exposure, the devastating pain that comes from being betrayed by a close friend, as we will hear in a few verses, even my close friend in whom I trusted. Other psalms express the same sentiment. Psalm 35, I went about as though grieved, I grieved for my friend or my brother as one laments his mother, I bowed down in mourning. Or another psalm, Psalm 55, it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together, but in God's house we walked in the throng. But again, pray these words together with fellow Christians. It reminds us that we are not alone. Especially we are not alone because Jesus, our Savior, knows our pain. He knows how it feels to be betrayed by empty words, by deception and betrayal and its shame. But Jesus also not just knows what we go through, but deals with it. He gives us its solution. He went to the cross for us in his glorious resurrection 
the victory that he won by his resurrection on Easter morning is also given to us so that we will not be ultimately betrayed by empty words, but have the word that Jesus Christ himself is. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise. Now may the peace of God which passes all our human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. The Canticle of the Magnificat. Let my prayer rise before you as incense.
We continue with the prayers, beginning with the litany we need. O Lord, O Christ, O Lord, O Christ, God the Father in heaven, God the Son, Redeemer of the world, God the Holy Spirit, be gracious to us. Be gracious to us. Help us, good Lord. From all sin, from all error, from all evil, from the crafts and assaults of the devil, from sudden and evil death, from pestilence and famine, from war and bloodshed, from sedition and from rebellion, from lightning and tempest, from all calamity by fire and water, and from everlasting death. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death, and in the day of judgment. Help us, Lord. We poor sinners implore you to, us, to rule and govern your holy Christian church, to preserve all pastors and ministers of your church in the true knowledge and understanding of your wholesome word, and to sustain them in holy living, to put an end to all schisms and causes of offense, to bring into the way of truth all who have erred and are deceived, to beat down Satan under our feet, to send faithful laborers into your harvest, and to accompany your word with your grace and spirit. We implore you to the Lord. To raise those who fall and to strengthen those who stand, and to comfort and help the weak-hearted and the distressed. We implore you to the Lord. To give all peoples concord and peace, to preserve our land from discord and strife, to give our country your protection in every time of need, to direct and defend our president and all in authority, to bless and protect our magistrates and all our people, to watch over and help all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation, to protect and guide all who travel, to grant all women with child and all mothers with infant children increasing happiness in their blessings, to defend all orphans and widows and provide for them, to strengthen and keep all sick persons and young children, to free those in bondage and to have mercy on us all. To forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and to turn their hearts. To give and preserve for our use the kindly fruits of the earth, and graciously to hear our prayers. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. O Christ, O Lord, O Christ, O Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The Lord be with you. And with your Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning. And though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
O pitying Lord Jesus, grant us of your gentleness and forbearance, of your compassion and love, and of your tender heartedness, that filled with your grace, we may always find fitting and salutary words to speak and willingly forgive the wrongs and evils done us. This we ask in your precious and mighty name. Amen. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.